Hello and welcome to another edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this edition, we will go step by step over reading of a cardiac spect and we will learn together how to optimize the value of attenuation correction and when to use it. And just a case to illustrate how important it is to have this tool uh, in our toolbox, attenuation correction, uh, to uh, optimize uh, images and give proper uh, diagnosis uh, and interpretation of the images. So knowing SPECT and uh, reading SPECT for uh, many, many years uh, uh, in the past and for years to come, uh, we have some challenges with SPECT that uh, are obvious. First one is the low count statistics. So it is amazing to understand that uh, how we get these images in spec, despite the fact that probably less than 0.001% of the counts end up uh, reaching the camera and uh, uh, giving us those beautiful images we look at. The other thing is the poor spatial resolution, especially in non-hybrid systems, where the nominal spatial resolution is about a centimeter some people say maybe it's less than that, but uh, in clinical practice, it's probably a centimeter or so. And it gets worse as patients uh, uh, are uh, gaining weight uh, and the uh, camera is away from the chest wall and the heart. So with that, the spatial resolution drops dramatically. The tissue boundaries are ill-determined by spec, uh, traditional spec, again, uh, non-hybrid systems. The long scanning time, uh, you have, you know, uh, to scan, uh, you know, now we have new ultra fast systems with CCT uh, cameras, but the traditional spec camera, you know, you can scan, scan the patients anywhere between uh, eight to 12 minutes for each set of images. Uh, we have a lot of attenuation artifacts that are known. We have uh, uh, diaphragmatic attenuation, breast attenuation, uh, soft tissue attenuation, arms attenuation, sometimes the arms are in the way. And then we have artifacts from left bundle branch block, ventricular phase rhythm. And then we're gonna talk a little bit in the next few slides about specificity, especially in obese and overweight patients. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about the aging uh, equipment. So as far as the uh, specificity for SPECT in detections of significant coronary artery disease, this is a very nice paper from uh, Randy Thompson, the incoming president of the American Society of Cardiology uh, from about 15 years ago, uh, stating that even uh, when BMI is under 30, uh, the uh, specificity of findings on a SPECT system, non-hybrid system, is about 64%. And we get uh, to a BMI above 40, this drops to about 17%. So most of the things you're seeing on these SPECT images probably do not represent coronary artery disease or obstructive disease. They represent, in fact, artifacts. And in a population like ours in the uh, Midwest and the United States, uh, this is not uncommon, maybe uh, over 20 to 30% of our patients every day uh, have a BMI above 40, and the majority of our patients are a BMI between 30 and 40. So we're talking about a specificity here, anywhere between 17 and 60%. So that's nothing uh, that we should be comfortable with. Now, CT attenuation correction uh, can mitigate this uh, loss of specificity. Uh, at least this is our experience and the experience in the literature. However, only 5.6% of centers in the US have used uh, or are, are using CT attenuation correction as of 2016. So that's a, a, a huge problem, uh, knowing that we have a solution for this uh, issue of attenuation. We have a population that's uh, where the BMI is going up uh, over the years and we still uh, are not applying the best technology we have uh, to, uh, uh, to mitigate this problem. So uh, the other thing is that we talk about is the aging cameras. Uh, most uh, systems in the country are, uh, uh, are older. This is an older study from 2008 to 2012. But uh, if you think about it, at that time, the cameras were all between five uh, and nine years old. Uh, most of these systems have not been replaced. Now we're in 2020, and I bet you most of these systems right now are in the range between uh, 10 to 20 years old, uh, because there's no really uh, financial uh, drive to replace these systems if they're still working. Uh, and back then, 40% of nuclear labs were scheduled to uh, have uh, uh, equipment replacement. They were hit, of course, uh, with the financial crisis in 2008, and most centers uh, delayed these capital purchases 
And now in 2020, with the uh, pandemic and the stresses to the healthcare system across the, the globe, actually, uh, I doubt we can have any uh, upgrades in camera systems, uh, or even if they're scheduled to have upgrade, probably we'll have a delay in that. So we're gonna be living with this problem of low specificity, older cameras, uh, non-hybrid systems uh, for, for a while. This prompt us, uh, myself and uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrew Higgins, when he was uh, one of our cardiology fellows and now he's an advanced uh, fellow, uh, to write actually this provocative uh, uh, editorial uh, to the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology, uh, saying that the future is here for SPECT and PET MPI, but unfortunately uh, uh, it's not evenly distributed. As you can see, only very few centers, very few uh, uh, sites have uh, advanced uh, technology. So we start with an illustrative case to show you how we uh, can use these uh, advanced technologies to overcome uh, uh, the issues of attenuation. This is a 53-year-old female with atypical chest pain. Uh, she has a BMI of 35. Uh, she's hypertensive. She was referred to us after a normal treadmill stress test that shows ST depression, not uncommon in a female. Uh, and she's uh, planning to have an esophageal surgery. Uh, uh, so therefore they stop the train there and they decide to divert the patient for a, another test for a certification. So they start with exercise stress test, didn't work. Now they move to a, a more uh, uh, advanced test. So this is a uh, image of her esophagus. I just showed you that because I was reviewing them as I'm reviewing the case uh, to uh, present here. She has echelasia of the esophagus. Uh, right here, this is a barium uh, swallow. EKG at rest shows normal signs rhythm with no uh, significant uh, uh, acute uh, changes and no baseline ST uh, or T wave uh, changes. Uh, we go through the steps. So she was uh, referred for a, for a stress test, uh, stress spect. Again, we go through all these steps, uh, except with PET, we usually do myocardial blood flow. Uh, at our center, because uh, to minimize radiation, we, uh, for patients under uh, BMI of 40, we do only uh, CT attenuation correction for the stress protocol, not for the rest protocol. If the BMI is above 40, then we do it for both rest and stress to maximize uh, or uh, improve the quality of the images. So this is the, uh, these are the transmission and emission images for the stress part of the test. Again, we do this to make sure we have uh, normal or complete uh, uh, regist co-registration of the perfusion and the CT uh, images. Uh, very well uh, register registered here. We don't expect any misregistration artifact. Uh, then we look at the uh, TOMOs or the raw images here. And you can see here, uh, specifically on the, on the stress images on top, uh, you have uh, uh, this uh, black shadow uh, on both sides of the chest. Uh, with uh, some eclipse of the uh, top part of the heart. Uh, the inferior wall is very well seen here, light to bright, but the top part is, uh, is eclipsed. And this is uh, characteristic or uh, uh, very well uh, known to represent the breast uh, artifact, not a uh, surprise in a female patient with large uh, BMI, you can see the rest, and stress images. Again, you can see the poor uh, count resolution in the rest images because we do, we do a rest and then stress protocol here. Uh, at our institution, and uh, we give, uh, let's say, 10 millicuries for rest, and uh, anywhere between 30 and 35 uh, millicuries with the stress uh, protocol. Uh, the patient was uh, wearing a belt, and you can see that's just an incidental finding of a belt buckle right here, uh, right uh, in her uh, uh, abdomen. Then we review the uh, reconstruction planes, uh, stress images on top, on the left-hand side, uh, Rest images on the bottom. Again, the uh, software did not recognize, uh, identify the heart properly. It was focusing on some GI activity here. All we have to do is drag this to the, uh, the cross here to the center of the short axis, uh, define our limits of reconstruction, uh, click construct, and then we get uh, the images we see next here. So these are the rest and stress images. Uh, you can see uh, uh, very uh, nice uh, images. Uh, rest, very nice uh, hot uh, inferior wall, uh, decrease counts in the anterior wall, uh, anterior, entero, uh, lateral wall right here, rest and stress uh, with sparing the apex. So in general, this is very uh, 
uh, I would say conveniently easy to identify as a breast attenuation, what we saw before, especially if we have normal wall motion here. But in a patient, let's say, who had a prior uh, bypass surgery, uh, for example, and you end up uh, with a situation like this. Uh, let's say a patient had a lima to the LAD, and now you're stuck. Is this a fixed defect in the proximal walls, in the proximal anterior wall, with good perfusion distally, or is this a uh, uh, is this a, uh, an artifact in a patient with uh, a patent LAD but uh, occluded diagonal or ramus uh, or stenotic ramus or diagonal? Is this an artifact or is this, is, uh, is this a breast attenuation? And I will show you this in a different color scheme that a lot of centers actually I know read in this color scheme. It's very hard uh, to conceptually say that we have normal perfusion uh, in the basal and mid anterior wall here and rest and stress images. I'm not saying there's ischemia, but there is a fixed defect here. Uh, you can pass it as uh, breast attenuation, but how confident are you uh, when, uh, when you do that? Now, uh, if you have uh, 30, 40,000, uh, 40, 50,000 probably specs under your belt, and you've read a lot of these specs before, you have a lot of experience, maybe you'll be more confident. But let's say you're reading this and a patient had chest pain during the stress test, or a patient had a prior history of MI, uh, not a patient like our patient here where she's being screened only for possibility of CAD, a patient with prior history of CAD. It's very hard to, to pass this as uh, uh, completely normal. And this is, these are the polar maps as constructed, uh, reconstructed here and scored by the uh, software compared to a normal uh, uh, polar map uh, of a female uh, a patient. Again, you can see this uh, perfusion defect here. Now I am, uh, comfortable, but not absolutely comfortable calling this uh, breast attenuation. Uh, but uh, we have, I'll show you some other images that will make you probably more uh, sure about your decision. Now, this is the uh, uh, rest images on the bottom, the histogram here, and the stress images uh, on the top here. This is, uh, again, a part of the QA process. We make sure that uh, we have uh, no PVCs. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, abnormal gating or uh, of the of the gated images that are going to come later. Again, you can see the uh, uh, the histogram for milliseconds uh, uh, per beat that drops with stress because the heart rate goes up, so it's inversely related to the heart rate. We go to the gated images here, and the gated images you can see actually uh, uh, normal uh, uh, wall motion. Uh, you can argue uh, that you don't see the anterior wall moving very well all the way to the base. And I agree with that. Similarly here, anteroceptal wall. Uh, but the ejection fraction is, uh, uh, is normal with normal volumes uh, down here. Uh, no, no, uh, no problems uh, on that front. Uh, we talked about this in prior uh, uh, videos. Uh, we get uh, 16 uh, uh, frames per cardiac cycle. Some other places do eight. Uh, we are comfortable with the 16. It gives us probably better temporal resolution uh, and uh, good quality uh, images. Uh, again, we reviewed array gated rest and stress images. Let's move to this one. Now we have the dyssynchrony analysis. Uh, again, anything under eight for the standard deviation here is normal. This is a normal patient up here. And this is our patient uh, down here. And you can see here in the green map here, we have some poor counts in the interior uh, wall. Uh, uh, poor you can count it as the synchrony or because of the uh, lack of counts, we're, end up, we're ending up with this uh, uh, green defect here. So again, I'm not very comfortable at calling this completely normal synchrony, despite the fact that the standard deviation is okay, just because of the poor counts here. Look at that normal patient here versus our patient here, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, lack of tracking of the, of the walls here. So then we review the CT images on this patient. You can see this is a very large patient with a very high BMI, uh, not uh, unusual for us to see the breast attenuation uh, artifact that we suspected. Again, very difficult uh, cases. Is this a breast attenuation? Is this a, a fixed defect in the LAD territory? Do we call it equivocal? So this depends on your level of confidence uh, on the prior history of the patient. Uh, on your experience uh, uh, with these uh, things, whether the patient had a prior history of CAD, prior history of uh, uh, revascularization. So now we have, we're introducing a lot of variables that can change your call from one patient to the next. And then we end up with how certain are you about uh, any of these interpretations? 
again, with, when you introduce a lot of variables uh, in reading your image, uh, it introduces inconsistencies, uh, I think, I believe, and non-specificity of the call. Now here, this, this is the same patient, and now we uh, use the uh, uh, tool we have, which is CT attenuation correction, to fix this issue, to mitigate this issue of poor counts in the anterior one. You can see here, right away, rest and stress, the anterior wall is completely normalized right now. The anterior septum is normalized. The anterior lateral wall is normalized. There is no doubt in your mind or my mind, there shouldn't be any, that this is a completely normal uh, uh, spec uh, images with stress versus the prior uh, images. And now when you do to, re, to the polar maps here, again, this is the rest images here. These are the stress images. Again, this is, uh, makes me extremely comfortable and uh, assured that I'm calling this a uh, normal study uh, without any of these uh, of these artifacts. So this is uh, putting all these images together. This is rest here uh, uh, on the uh, right. In the middle, you can see the stress images. Again, we have this uh, uh, defect. And then the uh, left here, you can see the attenuation corrected images post stress, uh, fixing all these artifacts and giving us a normal uh, image. We go to read the scan again, the same uh, normal way. Um, this is that the radiation dose the patient got from the CT. This is pre-op evaluation uh, for non-cardiac surgery. The reason she was intermediate risk is her uh, uh, baseline risk profile plus the fact that she had a prior uh, abnormal EKG stress test. Uh, this is the dose given: 13 at rest and 30 post stress. A treadmill stress test uh, for this patient. Clinical variables again. We entered them here. Uh, this patient uh, uh, reached uh, 9.4 METs. Uh, during the stress test without uh, uh, any EKG changes this time. She had some fatigue with the stress test, so this is uh, helpful. Uh, she had no prior uh, cardiac history, as I told you before, uh, BMI of uh, 35. Uh, we record the uh, rest and stress uh, images uh, for, uh, for function. Left ventricular function is normal, rest and stress. Right ventricular function is normal, uh, as we saw before. Uh, the volumes uh, get uh, translated here into the report and they go into the report. Then we go to the, uh, to the scan uh, results, a normal study as we've seen, as we've been aided or helped by the CT attenuation corrected images. There is no equivocation here, uh, no ischemia, no scar, uh, no TID. Actually the ventricle got smaller with stress uh, with a TID ratio of 0 0.77. Uh, no calcification in her uh, coronary uh, artery visualized on the stress test. And this is the, these are the results of the, of the stress test. Completely normal size study, good functional capacity, no equivocation, uh, again, aided uh, and uh, supported by the images from the CT attenuation uh, correction images. So the take home messages here for, uh, for you are understand the limitations of traditional respect and respect those uh, limitations. Uh, there is nothing to be cavalier about. This is a technology that has its limitations. Uh, the dynamic nature of population we are imaging compared to all the reports. So most of the data we have on the sensitivity and specificity of SPECT is actually spans the late 80s and probably 90s. So this is more than 25 to 30 years old data. Uh, the population ha has changed since then. We have older population with scanning. We have population with higher uh, uh, risk of CAD, population with higher BMI, much, much higher BMI. Uh, a population with much higher rate of prior revascularizations. So those sensitivity and specificities might not apply to a modern population uh, in 2020. Uh, so understand the declining specificity of SPECT with rising BMIs. This is not a US uh, only problem. This is a, a problem that's uh, spreading across the globe. Uh, incorporate attenuation correction in your practice to overcome the SPECT limitations and to feel more comfortable uh, about uh, reading uh, these scans, integrate all these findings and report uh, to give a, a clinical impression message that's clear, no equivocation. And uh, uh, I end up with this editorial uh, slide where it is, in my mind, unacceptable in 2020 that we have not modernized our spec cameras. I do not know of any echocardiographic lab in the US that accepts to have a technology, uh, echo technology that does not have uh, the most modern uh, software tools, including uh, tissue Doppler, uh, strain imaging, uh, 3D imaging, uh, contrast uh, uh, ability to acquire contrast imaging. Similarly in CT, 
uh, we know that it uses uh, a, a 32 slicer CT or 64 slicer CT to image the heart. Uh, everybody has moved on to uh, 256 plus. Again, with MRI, we moved uh, a long way from the era of uh, 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 old MRIs for the heart. Now we have uh, 1.5 Tesla and, 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 uh, and three. Uh, so, uh, so we accept these as given in echo, CT, and MRI. Yet in nuclear, we, uh, we do not uh, accept these things uh, as a given that we have to modernize our technology and adopt the best technology to, so we can serve our patients and not give uh, 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 results that has such low specificity uh, that you might as well better be off without the test. And uh, finally, if traditional SPECT were a consumer product, I think governments would have recalled it and forced us to use SPECT with CT or PET uh, scanning. Uh, now, there's a lot of promise also in SPECT uh, with CCT cameras. I personally don't have experience with that, but the uh, data from my colleagues uh, that I've seen uh, are very, uh, very promising. Uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, listening to this, uh, uh, watching this video with us. Uh, we will uh, see you extremely soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.